Well, good evening. Welcome to Proving Grounds Live. And we're really excited and appreciate you being with us this evening. You know, we have growers all over the nation, and we welcome the growers in Canada. This morning we had them in Ukraine. And so it's all about how do you and I take the next steps? You know, I want to challenge you tonight. All of us, including all these great farmers I have right here in front of me, need to understand the next step. So in other words, if we had President Trump's money, what would we do next year different than this year? You know, do we need a different combine? Do we have a different planter? Do we need to put up some nitrogen tanks for storage? I don't know what your next step is, but you have to know. Because that's just who we are, isn't it? We're driven to take and improve. I'm extremely thankful for the last three years, for the last three seasons, in 16, 17, and now the summer of 18 that we've had here in central Illinois. We are so blessed. And we've had, unlike other areas of the country, Iowa's awful wet, Indiana and Kansas are extremely dry. Illinois has kind of been the sweet spot. And so you're going to see pictures of corn, and you're going to see us talking about some pretty high yields, and we're very, very fortunate. So we're going to dig in, and we're going to think about what can you and I do to take us and our family farm to the next level. And you're an elite group. The very fact that you're out there this evening and you drove to a 360 dealer center so you could spend some time with us, it's greatly appreciated. So let's get started. You know, the environment has a huge part of what we do. And a lot of times we use it almost as an excuse. We can say, boy, nature's been really hard on us. And, and we sometimes fall back on that. We're looking at two fields here. On your left is a grower, and he's a good grower. This is not a disaster by any means. This is 210 bushel corn. The only problem is 30 inches away, if no fence in there, these two farms, and it's two farming systems different. The grower on the left planted the same day as the grower on the right. Probably different genetics, but they're all the same soil, planted next to each other, and there's 50 bushel difference. And so what you and I do as growers has a huge impact on how our family lives from year to year. So we're going to talk about these things, and we're going to talk at 360 how we think and how do we manage for the adverse conditions, whether it's I think back in 15, at one day in July at the dairy, we had nine inches over three days. And all of us admit that's way too much water. And nitrogen just went down straight out the tiles. And we were back in, in that case, we were back in applying more than what we ever had planned for. So the quest for us is to understand our inputs and understand where our break-evens are. I think back, our last corn sale was May 25th, and it's you know, quite different than what it would be today. And it's probably almost 60 cents different. And so that's a challenge that we live with. But we're going to talk about the things, about inputs and in, in, in yield themselves and the different profitability. So let's jump in. You know, this is a picture of our trailer. We're planting our own variety plot. And we do it every year because I'm trying to figure out which ones are the winners and which ones are the losers. And we plant a lot of conventional genetics because I'm trying to cut inputs. And it makes quite a difference. What we've found is if we don't have traded corn, it can yield within 17 bushel of all the smart stacks, and it's still a break-even situation. Interesting to me, as we do the varieties, one of the conventional genetics from a company out there went over 312 bushel last year in the plot. So I have almost 400 acres of it this year because I want to take and say, what is our net return? And I well realize that all these corns are not created equal. And there's corns in there that have upright vertical leaves and horizontal leaves and, and semi-flex ears and determinate ears. And do you and I know on our different farms which one to pick? Because in our variety plot last year, there was 60 bushel difference from the top to the bottom. And if you're heavy on that one, it's on the bottom. In a $3 corn market, we're what, $200 difference? So what do you pick and how do you decide? And I work a lot with Ken Ferry at CropTech, and Ken's done a fun, fantastic job the last two years. He spent a lot of time looking at each individual hybrid and classifying it and talking about you know, length of ear and leaf outlay and how does it fit narrow row corn versus 30-inch corn. And you can see here, I love this corn for 20-inch rows, 
It's got an upright leaf, and it comes almost down to the bottom, and then it starts to turn horizontal. For us, it's never about letting the sunlight hit the ground. You should have a cornfield that's so dark back in here, you're scared to go in at this time of the year. Then you know you're capturing 100% of the sunlight that the good Lord gives us. Versus this corn over here is a totally different animal than the one on the left. This corn was 14 feet tall. You can see Aaron there, and he's not short, the ears above his head. So there's things that we talk about, and we position corn for success. So tonight is about how do we manage input, spend less to earn more. And there's three things that we talk about here in our family farm. And that's the three things are how many rows around or girth. And then we talk about length. How did it pollinate? How's our nitrogen? Did we manage it? And then third, we talk about depth of kernel. What kind of a growing season did we have? And in Illinois, we've had the sweet spot on growing season here at the end. What do we need the last of the last 60 days the last 30 of them, we need brilliant sunshine, not a lot of wind, adequate moisture, no question. But this is huge for us. Depth makes a big, big difference. You know, you talk about it. If we, if we were, and you say, yeah, I figured I'd bump it. I've got so many things on, I can't figure out where to put all my things. If we had 16 rows around, by say even 38 long, and, and, you know, let's say we had 35,000 ears out there. And depending upon what the depth of kernel is, can make a huge difference. When we do kernel checks, we use 90,000. And that's just something we just do. Well realizing the growing season we've had this year, we're probably going to hit some of the varieties, could be as much as 75,000. In other words, great big kernels to fill that bushel. And every 5,000 equals 15 bushel. So if you went from 90 and you harvest, they were 85, that's 15 bushel more than you were counting on when you were doing your kernel counts. And so if you figured this at 75,000, these kind of ear counts, you're going to be at 300 plus. And Tim and I talk about it all the time. What are the things we need to design and build for you to use to get to where we have some plots that yield 400? Because we all realize national corn growers are in the 550s. I was talking to Dave Hula last year at the Louisville Farm Show, and he was really mad. And he said, Greg, it ticked me off. He said, the field that wasn't my contest field, there was areas in there that went as high as 640 bushel for more than 500 feet. I said, Dave, I really feel for you. Boy, you have trouble. Man, I mean, I would be mad too if your contest field was 545 and you had 640. And you say, is it possible that a kernel of corn can reproduce enough that you could go to 640 bushel, and it's done. The plant breeders will tell you it's possible with the right amount of nutrients and the right amount of rain and the right amount of sunshine in that factory, you can produce 700 bushel corn. And so if we're at 250, we got a ways to go, and I'm not unhappy at 250. I'm just saying this gets really interesting. And I'm not sure that we have to take ear counts. We do plots all the time. I got corn planted at 55,000 in super narrow rows. And we're looking at it. And so if you just take a look at it and you say, well, where, what would it take, Greg, to have a plot that reaches 400? If you had 40 ears or 40,000 per acre and they average 18 around and they were 40 long, and you start taking all this times and you had a 72,000 kernel count like we did in 2014, that is 400 bushel corn. So it's doable. So... Weather has a huge impact on this. Our task, you and I, our job is to make sure that we manage for that. So let's start in. First is girth. So we got a 14 around, a 16 around, and an 18 around. This one come out of a nitrogen plot we're doing. And we stress this guy early. In other words, in our bandit trials, we just didn't put any nitrogen on at planting time. And we said, let's just see what happens. Same genetic, same field. You can obviously see depth. The kernel is going to affect it. But every row is worth 10 bushel to you. And this happens early in this plant's life. We're talking B5, B6 corn, boot high. And we're setting on. 
And once you set 14, I don't care what Greg and his family would do. We could come out here and put the perfect nutrient package of cattle manure, whatever it would be, you're not going to add rows. So early on, we talk about early stress. So let's dig in and say, what are plant breeders? Plant breeders will tell you, and I'm down in St. Louis, they tell me, Greg, we design genetics for 20 around. I have counted 22 before, and I'll bet you a lot of you nod your head in here, you've seen the same thing. And so it's possible to get dramatic girth size on some of these genetics. You just don't want to be you and I setting this one on at 14 around. And you say, well, Greg, maybe the kernels will get really deep. It'll never catch up. And so the goal is let's manage. You know, Ken Ferry's talking about understanding which genetics are going to throw 18s and 16s, and I'm in the camp saying if we create the perfect farming system, no matter whether it's strip till, no till, full till, vertical till, it doesn't make me any difference. Let's figure out how we eliminate stress. So right out of the gate, she wants to start to go to 18 around. So at 360, I've been thinking about this for years. And about seven years ago, we started putting nitrogen on at the planter. And we call it base plus. So in a base plus system, you just start to work with nature. Remember the grower that here was on the left that had an ear that what? It was eight kernels pulled back because he ran out of in. What was happening here in this farming system? A once and done, and I get it. He's in hydrous in the fall, 100%. And if you're out there and you're doing 100% of your hydrous in the fall, I'm not going to beat up on you. I have one simple question. How do you know what the next 11 months are going to look like to the harvest of 2019? That's the quest that we're on. We're, we have to manage accordingly. Base plus is nothing more. We come in and we put 80 pounds of in on with the planter, and then we wait. And we let time go by. And the further we get out in the growing season, the smarter you and I become. And I well realize that 80 pounds is going to take me a long way. How long will that take me? That'll take me to head high corn. And so the 80 pounds that we're going to put on with the planter is going to create the perfect environment to make 18 kernels around. And so this gets my heart pumping. When you see these guys, you realize now we got ourselves in a position, if the rest of the growing season, the good Lord gives us the rain, or if we have irrigation, we're going to put ourselves in a position where we're going to raise more with less. So it's all about what are we waiting for? But we're waiting for these little guys. These little guys here, we call them Mike, microbials. These little guys are the best thing that ever happened to corn growers. That good bacteria will work hard for us. If the grower over here on the left-hand side, and he did, he put on 230 pounds of nitrogen in one blast. If Mike comes in like he did this year, and we track it almost every day, we're pulling soil scan of nitrates, and we're saying, what's Mike giving? And we can see what he gives because it goes up. We saw this year Mike did as much as 100 pounds free. I like that word. In other words, nothing. He gave us 100 pounds of nitrogen free. At, what is it, 40 cents? That's $40 an acre that you didn't write a check to your local co-op. And some of you in the crowd probably cringe because you sell nitrogen, and I understand it. But I like free. And so what we're doing is we're saying the planter is a sweet spot. And the reason the sweet pot, it doesn't matter where you live. I don't care if you're in the Dakotas, if you're in Nebraska here tonight, or Wisconsin or Ohio, corn grows the same wherever you go. That root's the same in Germany and South Africa and Ukraine as it is in America. That's the way God created corn. And so that root system just grows the same. So if we banned nitrogen, we're 2x more efficient than if we broadcast. So let's draw it out. We know that plants grow the same wherever they go. So we'll draw it out here. We'll put this little seed in here. So mama seed starts to spike and grow, and it'll put out some little seedling roots. It puts about four little seedling roots, depending on how your planter set up. They might run in the direction of the planter. If you didn't put a light sidewall compaction, they might branch out. They like to go out in a wagon wheel approach. And so the mesocotyl starts to come out, and you're going to set in a crown. 
And no matter where you live, that crown's always three quarters of an inch below ground. So anytime you and I want to know depth, this is a no-brainer. You measure from the crown, the mesocotyl, to the seed and add three quarters of an inch. So if I come to your farm and it measured an inch, you planted an inch and three quarters. If I come to your farm and made a quarter of an inch, that seed only got planted at an inch. In other words, that planter came up, went over top of something, and then down. And so this plant starts to grow. How long is it going to be happy on mama seed? To about V5, V6, and then it comes a day when mama seed runs out of starch and these new crown roots, and they grow the same. I already told you, no matter where you live, they grow out at a 35 degree angle. So if Greg's going to design a nitrogen system for a planter, and we know that every group root grows the same, why wouldn't we come in and come over about three inches on each side and position nitrogen just under the surface? Because I'm well aware, after 25 years of working on planter, how much downforce it takes to put an opening disc in. And if you're going to put two discs on each side down two inches deep, you're going to need over 700 pounds of downforce. And your planter doesn't have that much times 24 rows. And it's going to lift the planter. And pretty soon you're going to have erratic seed depth. And pretty soon we're going to have small ears. And you and I are going to be chasing our tails. And so we come in and we said, let's just go three quarters of an inch deep with it. Because we understand how nature works. The minute that nitrogen gets placed and, not, and liquid starts to come, it starts to dissolve and it starts to migrate down through the surface and the fusion takes place and as it comes down through your root is growing right through this sweet spot and the hair roots on those roots just go crazy they're as thick as the hair on your dog's back and you'll see this and so we're saying let's position in where it's in the sweet spot and let's let it migrate down with liquid and start to as it diffuses it's going to have less salt issues so as the new roots come out and we hand the baton from mama seed to the new crown root, we want to make sure we have really happy corn. Because that's nature's cruel little trick. The exact time that's happening, that plant's deciding, am I going to be 16, 14, 18? What am I going to put on around? And like I said, once it's set, it's set. So we think about this a lot. And we say, how do we position in? Well, realizing that these guys are going to be coming along pretty soon, and they're going to help us out. And I want to use every bit of the nitrogen that they're going to give us back. Now, they also use nitrogen. So if I went out and broadcast on a corn on corn, 100 pounds of 28 with a floater, and we got on a warm weekend, Mike and his team are going to explode. There's a huge amount. How many, how many ton of good guys do you think you have on a healthy soil? It's amazing. 18 ton per acre. 36,000 pounds, which equals 36 1,000 pound steers standing on every acre of your cornfield. If you take care of them. What I mean by taking care of them is your pHs. Better be in a 6.4 or really close to it. What do you think? How many of these 36 steers are alive if you let your pHs go to 5.9? How many do you think? One. 1,200 pounds of bacteria in a 5.9 compared to 36,000 pounds in a 6.4. So that's why we don't go to sleep. We take soil tests. We manage. We work with our local ag retailers, and we make sure we're liming and keeping this what we call in the sweet spot. So we jumped in and we said, you know what we need to do is design a planter. Because the planter pass is free for Greg. I'm going to be planting every acre. And when I'm planting it, why wouldn't I, if it's two times more efficient in a band, because Mike can't eat the whole band. He'll work on it. But it's different than a broadcast. And so that's going to help us tremendously. And so we said, let's create a nitrogen system that does no harm. What I mean by no harm, it's not going to knock in the top on top of the seed, so we got dry dirt on top of the seed and get misfires. It's going to be positioned right behind the gauge wheels, right before the closing wheels. We're only adding five inches in here. It's going to have adjustable springs, so very handy if you go from no-till to full-till, you're going to have the capability 
and it's going to be designed that it's going to position nitrogen with a seed tube guide right below the surface. And so you can see the seed here. The seed's planted an inch and three quarters. We colored the nitrogen. You can see a strip of it here and here. It's six inches apart or three inches on each side, and it's just under the surface. So as that planter goes by, closing wheels close up the seed trench, a chain we're dragging behind, we're going to have two bands of liquid. I wanted to show you what 23 gallon, that's the number we use. We use 23 gallon of 32%, plus we have some sulfur in there, thiosol. So at 23, we'd have about 2.3 gallons of that. So we've got 25 gallon. That equals two cc of a cattle syringe per square foot. So I took a square foot of paper, I sprayed two cc in a broadcast. Then I took the cattle syringe and showed you what two bands look like and it stood up off the paper almost a quarter of an inch. So if Mike and his team are over here and you have a lot of residue, they're going to use the nitrogen here to break down the residue. Same here, only the corn plant is going to be able to find some. So as you watch this planter run, you can see the white hose tube guides. Well, let's watch this one first. You can see we're over three inches. Disc is running about three quarters of an inch. You can see the chain on the back. If we come here, you can watch the hose tube guides. And you can see we're positioning in three quarters of an inch below ground. So we got, looks just like a seed firmer, and it's holding right into that trench. And so this is what I mean by putting nitrogen in the sweet spot. In a base plus, we're going to put some of it down. So depending upon what your program is, it could be 60 units. I've had guys put as much as 140 down. I would like to see you in that 60 to 75 maybe as high as 80. If it was corn on corn, I might put as much as 90 units down. And now you've got yourself in a position where you can let nature show her hand. And if it's going to be a tremendous growing season, we're going to be off to the races, and you'll come back in later in the season and present some more. This is a 360 dealer. He has two planters. He has banded on one, planted these same day. And you can see the banded, banded nitrogen compared to broadcast it's two collars higher on the same day. And so we've advanced that plant, and we've taken it to a new level. And so these are things. Does this exactly translate to yield? Well, we'll take a look and we'll see. So here's the same amount of nitrogen on corn ground, I mean, sorry, corn on beans, broadcast, compared to banded. And so you can see here there's about a seven bushel difference. Now, these are kernel checks. These are not combine yet. We're probably two weeks away from starting to go through the fields. We got the silage done at the dairy, but we got more, you know, we got a little bit of time. I'm, I know always my start date. It's always after Farm Progress Show. So we get back from Farm Progress Show, we celebrate Labor Day, and then we fire up combines. Over here on the corn on corn, quite a difference in there. What's the difference here? The broadcast happened what? We had a lot of residue there. Mike and his team are bu building all the nitrogen up, and you can see it. You can see it here that we pulled back. Every kernel in length is worth six bushel to you. So that begs the question. If we're going to put nitrogen on the planter, what do we have to equip it with? How do we do it? And you can see, this is about six years ago. You can see here, we were just pulling a, you know, a couple thousand gallon tank behind the pickup, and we're nursing the planter tank here, and we're out here saying, we believe that nitrogen counts. I would say if we polled every group, as many as there are of us, 10% would raise their hand and say, we are putting liquid on with the planter. That means there's 90% that are thinking and saying, what's the next steps in our operation? And I realize that there's a lot of questions. How do I do it? Where do I get the manpower? Where do I carry in? So 360, we jumped in. We said, look, we need... And you can see this old boy's picking them up and putting them down. He's got a high-speed planter. He's got speed tubes in here. He's running along here at 10 mile an hour. And we've got 700 gallon that we positioned, including the tanks he's got on his planter. We boosted it by 700 gallon up on the tractor. And I said, if we're going to design tanks, the most critical thing for me is we get weight distribution. I do not want all that weight on the front axle. I'm well aware of center yield drag on CCS planters, and it's real. If you can get by if only 8 to 10 bushel, you should be smiling. 
I've seen as much as 60 bushel drag in the six rows in the center of a planter when it's wet. And that's serious. That translated to 27 bushel across the whole field. And so in this case, we said we're going to position it so the weight's back on the rear axle. We're going to make sure that we're going to mount it inside the duals. I don't want my heart rate so high every time I travel down the road to the next field that I, you know, I can't hardly contain, you know, people are meeting you on the road. Standard saddle tanks in the industry are 17 feet wide. And so I challenged our team and said, we will live within the shadow of the duels themselves. And then it's critical that we have good visibility. I said, we've got to be able to see in the field. So they're mounted low, there's room between the hood, and that's just some of it happens. So there's a lot happening in the spring. I think we'll all admit to that, probably even more so than in harvest. There's a lot of things that are begging for our time. So in our operation, we're planting beans. At the same time, we're planting corn. Yes, this is a high-speed planter. This one has speed to, this happens to be exact emerge from deer. So there's a lot of technology out there that you can write a check for so you can go faster. And then comes along Greg and they said, you know what you need to do? You need to sit at the ditch bank and load nitrogen. You say, well, wait a minute. I just wrote a check to go fast to get more done. And now you're sitting here. In this case, our truck, we got starter and nitrogen. So we're loading two different products. As we sit there, it's real. This will be a classic day for our team. 12 minutes per stop. We got it down like NASCAR. We moved pretty fast. We got liquid tanks up on the tractor. We got starter here in the center. 10 stops per day is very common for us. And so we're sitting for 120 minutes a day or 100 acres a day. And I challenge our team. And I said, this isn't going to work. We got guys buying high speed planter technology. We've got guys buying bigger planters so they can get more done as their acres grow. And now we're asking them to sit along the side of the road. I said, for years, we had grain carts chasing combines. And combine never stopped. Why in the world are we stopping the planter? And so the 360 sprint system come out. And you can see a gator here carrying 300 gallon of 32% uh, chasing this planter. This planter never stops. They'll load starter at the beginning of the field as they add seed, and then that planter goes. So no longer is it stopping every 36 acres to take on liquid. And we had four of these systems running around the Corn Belt. And my guys are just like everybody else. They said, ah, Greg. They kind of get a lot of me at times, and we do introduce new technology. My farm team's the guinea pigs. And they just kind of chuckled and laughed and said, yeah, this gator thing, and good guys. They were willing to take it out the first day. I didn't say a word. And that night I knew when I won, when at 6.30 Aaron called and said, I don't know what you're doing, but we got to get the sprint over to Merle's 50 because we cannot plant without it. He said, I cannot stop. Once you tasted it, it's hard to stop. So that first day, they did seven fields, 415 acres, planter never stopped. And I knew that we had won, and you watch him here. This happens to be chasing our seed planter. This is a 30-inch planter, and you can see he's coming up, and he's going to hook up, and it's much easier than you ever thought to run it. This, you know, we got a 75-year-old truck driver. In this case, it happens to be Andy, who's 19. But we got a gentleman that's 75 years of age, and he never missed a time. And so they're hooked up. That 300 gallon is going to take a little less than three minutes. In this case, this larger field, this planter is needing 300 gallon every round. And all day long, that gator kept up to the point that we never, after field one, we never ever used our tanks in the tractor again because of the fact all that weight on there, rooster tails on those tracks. So the rest of the year, every seed field, we use just the 400 gallon tank in the planter. And Aaron said, we can sell those tanks off as far as I'm concerned. He said, I would rather buy the gator for the same price of these tanks and take all the weight off the tractor itself. So I'd like to have you hear from a grower direct. And so this grower is about 30 miles south of me. Let's listen to what Mark Miller has to say about the 360 Sprint. When I saw the uh, 360 Sprint system introduced last year at the Farm Progress show, I thought this looked like just the way that I could make my 16 row work like a 24 row as far as productivity 
where I can keep that thing running instead of having to stop and fill every so often. So we've increased our hopper capacity on our planter. So now when we fill up, we go in with the idea that we can fill up enough seed for 80 acres and between the Sprint system and the two products with Starter and our 32, we can plant an 80 acre field without stopping at this point. And the efficiency that this has added where the planter can just keep going, it's just, it's really amazing how I just sit in the tractor and go, I don't have to stop. It's just been an overall a great experience and it's been, it's been a, a, actually a fun season for planting corn. Well, we appreciate working with the growers that we did. So next year, we'll be out pretty strong with, with quite a few of these systems out. And uh, Mark happens to be with us here tonight. And so it was pretty gutsy. So for the first time, he's moving starter and 32%. So one of the funnels on the row one is for nitrogen. The funnel on row 16 is for starter. He had a little strobe light set up so from the cab, he would have it flashing. So when the, his nurse driver is bringing starter, he's gonna go to the right funnel. He's gonna make sure that he gets it right. And it's all about efficiency. Planting corn on the right day. We'll talk about it. What is the right day? Because you can plant corn on the wrong day and I'll tell you, you'll repent for the whole season. And it's hard to look at those fields when you get it wrong. So it's all about when it's right, getting the maximum amount of acres in that we can. Besides nitrogen, let's talk a little bit about starter. Now we've already said, this little guy is not living off his root system. He's living off a of mama seed. And he's extremely happy. He doesn't have any idea what's ahead of him. And remember, at this stage, we're all about increasing rows around. Yes, some in length. But mainly, we're talking about good day every day. This plant doesn't go under stress. When I start talking about starter to growers, you get this look in their eye. It seems like it's easier for them to think about nitrogen on the planter than it is to put starter on the planter. For years, we've done research. 15 bushel is easy within grass. As I'm watching starter plots this year, even planted in May, it looks to me like we're going to be a solid 20 bushel plus with starter. Here's the quest. We talk about putting starter, in our case, we put it on the seed from fence row to fence row. We know that 1034.0 and some zinc, we know that for every one inch equals $3 of cost of product only in starter. So if you're six inches between seeds, you're $18 right out of the gate for just the product. For us, we won't use starter without zinc. I would highly recommend having a white label chelated zinc in if you're starter without it. I'm not sure you'll see near this kind of response. So that's going to cost us $5 an acre. We also put a product called Avail, and that's $5 an acre. So Avail's in here. We got zinc in here. So we're looking at $28 an acre. As I work with growers around the country, it's common to see some talk about as much as $35 an acre. And that's when the frown comes on the, on the forehead and they're like, I'm not sure in a $3 corn market, this is going to make any sense for me. And we realize that if we're going to maximize yield potential, we cannot have a bad day in the field. So we challenged our team and we said, let's take a look at this. So let's dive in. We realize this little guy is just putting out some seed. This is here at our dairy. This is top fertility. But this little guy's seeding roots are going to be hungry because it's all driven by temperature if there's any phosphorus available. Until that soil gets to 65 degrees, it's not going to be available to the plant. It will not release off the soil until 65 degrees. So for the whole month of April, in this case, it's 53 degrees. That little guy's hungry. He's looking everywhere for phosphorus. He cannot find it because it's not released. So if you and I could come in and if we could put some starter right beside him, think what a difference that would make. So at 360, the engineering team said, what if we would cut this by 50%? In other words, what if we design technology, instead of going from fence row to fence row of starter, we would just do half of it. We would just put a three inch dash of product out. And then nothing in between here. Then again, three inches, only where the root system is going to feed. And so we take this $28 to $14. All of a sudden now, 
in a 350 corn market, we only need three to three and a half bushel to pay the difference. Now all of a sudden growers are saying, well, wait a minute, if that's possible, I could be in. What's that look like? So DASH is all about understanding where the seed is. We designed a special valve, so every time we see a seed, we put out a DASH of product, and we position it wherever your choice is. You could put it on the seed, you could put it right next to the seed, and so we can take a look at it here. You can see there, you see a seed come under the firmer, boom, product. Every time it's putting three inches right over the top of the seed. So your choices are many. And we argue about it all the time at the supper table. Where would be the best place? Tim and I are talking about it. So for years we did what? We dribbled it right down the Keaton seed from around the top. But we know we could come in and put three inches right on top of the seed, or we could come and put it right beside the seed. Now Greg's getting excited. I'm in. Because I always worry about salt burn, what kind of seed quality we have. And so we're, taking, we're looking at three inches. We're looking at putting two inches here beside. So now we cut it 50%. Now we've taken it a third again. And so all of a sudden it gets kind of exciting to say, well, if we had this kind of technology, what would it look like for yield? So we go out and we started putting out plots. Thanks to Scott here in the room, we got this little eight row 30 inch planter and it's got tanks all over it. It's got four different tanks. So we can put all the magic in a bottle of biologicals. Uh, we put water only on. There's something interesting to me about water only on seed. If that yields more, I'm gonna be just like Pepsi selling bottled water. You'll have to buy Greg's special water. It'll be really special. And so we're looking at all these different alternatives. We positioned it at 34,850 population because that put the seeds exactly six inches apart because that's what we wanted to check and we wanted to look at. We picked a 92-acre field um, a little ways away from us, and instead of planting it the half-mile way, we planted it sideways. So you can see every eight rows is a different treatment of a different amount in a different place. It could be a dash. It could be continuous. It could be none. And then we fly airplanes over all of our fields, and we're looking at, you know, infrared photography, so NDVI it's called. So every week across our fields, the airplane is flying across, and we're getting maps, and we're taking and saying, what's this corn feel like today? And it's a no-brainer. These are the spots that are checks compared to the spots that are green. So you start to look at this, you say, I think there's going to be a yield difference here. And we take the engineering team out, and we start to dig a lot of plants. And so the exact same footage away from the headland, we dug 10 feet of plants up, or 20 corn plants, and we weighed them on a very detailed digital gram scale. And you can see here that compared to the check, we had 26% more plant weight at this stage. Does that translate to yield? We'll find out. And so we did it in lots of different, 15 gallon an acre, 10 gallon an acre, 5 gallon an acre, and then the check. Interesting to me, when you look at the 20 plants, you see that the three inch dash was 5% heavier than continuous starter at the same rate. Now I'm really interested. You're saying if I put on half the product, I can still actually have more plant weight? And then we take it to yield, and this is off the furrow. So this is three quarters to the side. You can see the check here. You can see the ears, 223, two inch, 258. 3-inch, 254, and 252. So I call these, these are kernel checks, I call those a wash. But you didn't have to have, Tim didn't have to show me the flag when I'm walking through every eight rows and I'm taking ears. And we take ears, I grab an ear, then I count three, I take three, six, 10, 13 ear, and that's what we count. And that's just an average of that spot at 90,000 kernels is what we're doing. On furrow, in furrow, the check, two, three, continuous, and so there's, there's some interesting numbers here that we're gonna take a look at. At the end of the day, it's about this though. If we're gonna maximize rows around, we can't have corn ever have a bad day. And so for you and I, that's our job. You're a plant manager. You say, well, no, I'm a, I'm a farmer, Greg. No, 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 you're, you're a plant manager of every plant. Every seed I plant, I expect a 700X return. In other words, every one I put in the ground, I expect 700 back. And so starter and nitrogen are part of our system. It doesn't mean we add more. It just means I back it out of my fall program. If I know how many pounds of N, P, and K I'm going to put on for the next year's yield goal, I just back it out of that. So it's not like I'm spending extra dollars. 
Let's talk about nitrogen. You saw the guy on the left here that was eight kernels light. He was a once and done guy and he just missed guess. He just gave up on it, didn't he? The most amazing thing about that is, I don't understand. In our area here where we live, I know what my average CEC is. You have that on your soil test and you can look that up. For us, it's 15 average. My highest is 23, my lowest is nine. The most interesting thing is, those soil types live next to each other three feet away. This is dark, this is light. This nine makes your heart burn when you think about fertility. Because a farmer style, not agronomist, the agronomists all around the nation now are gonna get a weary look in their eye. You take it times 10, your number. That's the most nitrogen you can put on at one time that's going to stay there. It's all about your dinner plate. If you went through the dinner here, wherever you're sitting, and you go for supper tonight and they hand you a pie plate and you're trying to balance two barbecues, baked beans and potato salad, it isn't going to work, is it? And all this is is saying how large is your dinner plate? And how are you going to fit, you know, the pork chop that you're going to put on there and then you got potatoes and pretty soon you got stuff spilling off. So when you tell me you're a once and done guy, and I see it in my neighborhood. I see growers that are putting on 225 pounds of anhydrous. Oh, but they say, well, we got inserve in there. Oh, I well understand that. How much did they lose? 150 is the max they can hold. The rest went where? Down the tile. And so you have to pay attention to your CECs to make all this work. So if we're going to manage length, we got to have nitrogen there at the right time. Let's take a look at Fred Bilo from the Dr. Fred from the University of Illinois did some interesting studies. V10. He set up to V10. That's head high corn. Well, shoulder high on me. I'm not the tallest guy in the world. So right here, corn here. Fred Bilo says after years of research, it only uses 25% of its total needs up to that time. Then exciting things start to happen at head high corn. From there on to harvest, it uses 75%. So if you and I are going to maximize kernel length, we're going to need to make sure that that hungry corn plant is satisfied at the end. So we're going to do some split application of end. Every time you split nitrogen, you're going to gain money. It's a given fact. In this case, we see here, we're out in plots, and we're side-dressing corn that's V8. You saw that it was up to the axle. So we're waiting. I'm wanting to go as long as I can to say, how much is Mike and his team going to give us for free? And so we'll have a soil scan out there, and we'll be probing down 12 inches, and we're watching it really close. And so we're putting that in a bucket. We come in. Anytime we're under 10 parts per million of nitrates, Greg gets ready to apply. We're not going to run that plant out. I'm not going to have that plant think it's running out and we start to pull back. So those are things that we look at. For years, we've run colders down the center and the side dress time of a 30-inch row. And then four years ago, wide drop come out. And it radically changed how we position in and the timing of when we position in. And you can see we're laying in right on top of the ground at V6. And you say, oh boy, that, that's really different than a colder in the center of the row that's two inches deep. I like my nitrogen under the ground. Really? We've taken a hard look at this. We've researched it. I've seen nitrogen beside the plant for over 49 days without a rain. And the plant responds to the nitrogen compared to a colder in the center of the row. Ken Ferry has talked to me one day. He said, I've told my growers to stop putting the colder in the center. At Wapella and Clinton, they went 49 days without water after planting. And they started to say, you have to put the nitrogen beside or we're going to lose out. Let's take a look at it running. So you can see it here. And it's running that nitrogen right beside the stalk, right where the root system is on top of the ground. You say, well, Greg, I'm really nervous about the sunlight I see here. And so... Put an agritain, plus put a stabilizer in if you want. Personally, we don't. But we're going a little later than a side dress bar. We're using our sprayers, and we're waiting until corn's almost shoulder high and head high. So what's the difference? 
For the last three years, all around the nation, we've checked it. The national number is, after three years of many, many plots, it's six bushel more by positioning next to the root compared to in the center of the row. Same amount of N. And you look at that and you say, ah, I don't know, where's the magic? How, how can it be six? You're saying if you both put 100 pounds on, it's six bushel more? Yeah. Yeah, I am. And here's why. We went to Dr. Mulvaney at University of Illinois, and he's an environmentalist and a good one. You know, he's one of the tree hugger types. And he's always worried about us farmers that are using more nitrogen maybe than necessary. And I said to him, mix me up some nuclear N. And nuclear nitrogen has the ability, you can track it anytime for years. <laughs> Literally, on these plots, if you went back 10 years, you could probably find the end yet because it's there. And you can trace it. So over here on the wide drop and over here on the colder, we put on 100 pounds on V8 corn. And then we come in at harvest at 31% or black layer. We cut that corn off, packaged it up, took it to university, and they ground up the stalk, the leaves, the tassel, and the ear. And they measured how much end did the plant itself take in. And when I say six bushel, it come from the fact that we had 25% more uptake of N than a colder in the center of the row. And so it makes sense to me that we'd have more yield, and we've seen it year after year. So we're going to take care of length by making sure we don't run out of nitrogen. Probably the most one, though, that I'm most concerned about is kernel depth. This kernel compared to this kernel. These are in two different classes, folks. You look at this, and it, it makes an amazing amount of difference. Like I already told you, that additional weight for every 5,000 less kernels it takes to fill a bushel, it's 15 bushel more. And so this is at the end of the race. What happens at the end of the race? Well, you better make sure you have enough nitrogen. I like this guy. He's talking to me. He might be saying the population's not high enough. He pollinated all the way over the tip. But we talked already about gray leaf. I was talking to the group here before we started. I've never seen gray leaf worse in a lot of our hybrids. And so we, across the board, we spray fungicide. And it's not that we flip a coin. Way back in January, and we're doing our cost of production spreadsheets, I just pencil in right there, $21 an acre. And it's not like we're going to say, on June 16th, I'm saying, boy, I wonder if we're going to have gray leaf this year. We blanket spray every year. We can't guess. And if you didn't this year in this area, it's going to be painful. You will find fields in this area that look like they're ready to harvest tomorrow. What's happening? Disease is taking it down. This plant is a factory. That big old leaf is hanging there, and the sun's shining on it, and it transpires. In other words, the respiration's taking place, and it's drawing water. Right now, the vacuum pump is on high out in the field. It's just sucking water up. How deep? Well, roots go as deep as what? As corn grows tall. What do we got here? Nine feet? So this root system underneath here, if you and I have managed our production and our farming system, roots better be nine feet deep and pulling a massive amount of moisture and nitrogen up. Now, if you told me your B soil horizon is a hard blue clay, one of the questions this morning from Kentucky was, we have a soil that nothing grows into 14 inches deep. In that case, your roots are going to be 14 inches deep. They're probably not going to grow. But for you and I can manage this, it makes quite a difference. So this leaf is a factory, and it's going to have sunshine happening, and it's going to pump a mountain amount of energy into this ear. And that's our goal. So we go back to this gentleman. Eight kernels missing. You can just count them. And they pull back. Not a bad farmer. I'm not beating up on him. I'm saying he lost the opportunity. He could tell his sweetheart in the kitchen, you know, we're having a tough year. Boy, just not as good as I hoped. When 30 inches away, look at the difference. And this just coming up a wide drop later season and it started to spread. Because I realize not every year is the same. And you can see here, the black line is 2018 in our area. And we did it to August 1st. It's almost verbatim, like the red line, which is 2016. Look up here at the green guy. This is where I talked about having massive amounts of rain through the growing season. And we flush nutrients out of the soil profile. 
Where water goes is where nitrogen goes. And so then you can look at 2012, and nobody in here wants to even think about it. 2012 was a generational drought for Greg. We had 250 bushel corn ground making 76 bushel down by Route 136. 2.2 inches of water from planting to harvest. You think you can raise corn on 2.2? Not a chance. And so these are the things that happen to us. So we have to manage a systems approach accordingly. Watch this young man here. So he's in here in head high corn. It's just about starting the tassel. You can see it if you look in the back here. You can see just a few random tassels starting. And he's doing what today? He's putting nitrogen on to finish the race. For years, we worked with him here, and for years he was once and done. So he would come out in the fall, and he would check the box, and he had it done. And his agronomist was a pretty smart guy, and so they would take their yield goal, which is 230 bushel, is what their yield goal is, and they took it times 1.1, because that's what it takes to raise one bushel of corn, 1.1 pounds of nitrogen. So if your goal is 230, he would put on 255 pounds in one big gulp. He'd throw it out there in the fall of the year. And you can see it here. So over here, pre-plant, he put on 255 pounds of N to raise 230. And you heard me say at the beginning, at 360, I live to lower inputs and increase yields. And that sounds like that's not possible. You say, wait a minute, you're going to spend less to earn more? That doesn't work in the real world, Greg. Yes, it does. It does if we manage the inputs in a way where we work of nature itself. And so over here, he put on 255 units. Over here, for the first time, he put a planter pass of 75 pounds of N to carry him into the growing season. Then when you saw him out here spread, he took a soil scan, he probed, and he says, I don't need 255, I only need 105 more. So right out of the bat, he put $35 an acre into his hip pocket of pure cash. He dropped himself in $35 more an acre, and he raised 11 bushel more. And he said, Greg... On my 1,000 acres of corn, I net it $80 an acre or $80,000. do not tell me you can't replace kitchen cabinets and trade pickups and buy different combines and look at the neighbor's farm if it's for sale. It's a matter of you and I understanding a farming system that lets you capitalize on whatever the growing season is going to look like. So those are real things that are out there. You take a look. We do it down in southern Illinois. We've got a nitrogen study going. 100% of the end, this gentleman wanted to put on 180 across the board. He decided that in the wintertime. So you go with that test. I said, you bet. We'll play. So he did 180 pounds of anhydrous all in one shot. He come in and put 70 pounds on later with a wide drop. He did 70 pounds of bandit, 110. You can see as you go through, wide drop bandit, wide drop bandit. And he did it at different levels. And there's what? Almost... 25 bushel difference, same amount of inputs. Now, we got to harvest it. I well realize these are kernel checks, but these are things that we talk about. How about timing of planting? When do you go? How do you know? It's tough in the spring. Everybody's geared up, planters in the shop, you're ready to go, and we run into some tough conditions this year, and now you're in the field at this stage, and you're downtrodden. Look at this guy here, late emerger. How do you know he's late emerger? Look at the bottom of the plant. Stock diameter is half of his neighbor. This gentleman planted 32,000. 24,000 ears like this. And he has a whole mess of these late emergers that are doing what? Late, so they're the last restaurant open in town, the Japanese beetle at pollination now, when he finally starting to drop pollen, mowing it off. The agronomist comes in this field and says, I got bad news for you. You're going to have to spray this field of insecticide or you're going to lose every bit of the kernels that you have here. And so this is reality. How did this happen? Come back to not being able to sit in the shop come April. 
2018 in central Illinois, the coldest April ever on record. And you can see here, we got temperatures below 40 degrees. I talked to a gentleman in the area and he said, I don't care what the temperature is, Greg. I look at the calendar. It's time to go. And he went. And he wondered why we weren't planting. And I said, I'm not putting any corn in into this environment. And it was wet and cold. Now, I would have loved on April 15th to be putting beans in. That's my plan. Bean planters hooked up, ready to go. You know, we got the tender loaded. We're ready to fire because we know that high-yielding beans come from early planting. I've done all kinds of study on foliar sprays and nutrient packages on beans, and they bip around, and one year it makes a bushel or two more, and you pay for the product. Most times not. I don't even spray beans at fungicide, but that's just me. That doesn't mean you shouldn't. I can't get it to pay for the product. I'm sure there's time, well, if there's spider mite and those type of problems we're spraying. So I was hoping to put beans in here. We didn't plant beans until here. April 25th was the first day of beans in. So I'm worried about, am I going to get my 15 bushel bump that I was hoping for? But the corn didn't happen until here. May 2nd's the first day of corn for us, and then on, and we're off to the races. So what happened? Well, that gentleman lost 8,000 plants of late emergers. It come down to his corn. Is it a Florida beach bum or an Eskimo? And it's simple to check. It's called saturated cold germ. It's really all about the first drink. Corn, you can't fool it. So we're coming out here and we're positioning the seed. It's never about the day we plant. You're planting on a Tuesday evening and you see, what are you worried about? 36 hours from this very moment. What is going to be the temperature of the first drink through the pericarp. If it's 50 degrees or less, you're in trouble. You'll scramble the germ. You will get late emergers or no emergers at all. You will have corn like that I just showed you that are late emergers that you're gonna have to end up chasing money on a horse that's probably gonna be lame. And so it's all about, what if it was 55 degrees or greater temperature when the first drink comes in? I like that. So if you say, well, Greg, you don't understand. We got a 16 row planter. Our farm is growing. We got to start corn. I don't know why. Looks to me like the last three years, all the highest yields are coming out of May, even June first corn last year in the area. There was a grower had 276 bushel planted on June 3rd. And I look at that and I say, the environment has changed. Genetics have changed. And so in this case, if you check this corn, and how do they check it? They just take it into a lab and they plant 100 seeds in 50 degrees sand for seven days. On the eighth day, they warm it up to 80 degrees and they count how many grew. On that first genetics, by the way, that one that was 64% was the one I spent the most for, wasn't that figure? I wrote the highest check for the highest genetic potential for yield and it tested, what, 62? Better get the right figure. I want to say 62 yeah, it is, 62%. You would not plant this 36 hours into a cold front that's about to rain. If you do, you might as well just drop a salt block on your toe. Same thing. And so if you're going to plant, you're going to plant the one that's 94. So we test every genetics. We pop open all the pro boxes, dish out one gallon baggie, and we send it to the lab, and they tell us. So the one hybrid had 62 seeds out of 100 that grew. The other one had 94 seeds out of 100 that grew. They're not the same species. And so these are things you pay attention to. After my neighbor planted, I put a soil thermometer in at two inches, and that morning, 36 hours after planting, it was 40.8 degrees. Success or not? Did it pay to hurry out the gate? I don't know. We'll find out when the combines run. When you take a look at him, though, here he is. He's a weed. This is the guy right here we're talking about. And you go in the field, and the Japanese beetles are having a heyday. I mean, they're just mowing them down. They're all over the place. And they're mowing it off before it's going to pollinate. So then you're forced to come out. And you're running through there with insecticide. Actually, this is us running through a fungicide. This sprayer here is running at 12 mile an hour. It's got the 360 guide system on it. So it's running on auto steer. Jan's sitting in there texting. Not paying any attention because that sprayer is guiding itself. It's got boom height control on glide, 
And so it's keeping the booms the right height. And he's in here putting 18 gallon an acre on. Yes, we have undercover down in on the riser and it's got three nozzles spraying up and out. Why are we spraying from the bottom up? Because most of your leaf openings are here. So I told you we book insecticide, fungicide across the board. When we book in about 20, oh, I think we booked in 21.95 an acre. We go out and we start working and we found a product for $10 an acre, just like it. And I'm not a huge generic fan. I well realize I'll take criticism for this. But for $10 an acre, I could spray it, the same exact product. We could cover this and we could take gray leaf and put it in check. And we didn't have to wonder if we had it coming. So we always worry about the ear leaf. That's your golden ticket. The ear leaf has a tremendous impact on what the weight is. So you're looking at the leaves at the bottom, and you see the gray leaf coming up from the ground. When we get two leaves below the ear leaf, and if I could take all these lesions, and they fit on a quarter, or they cover a quarter, I'm talking about nickel-dime quarter, it's time to spray, because it's a matter of moving up quickly. And once you get on the ear leaf, and you start ruining this factory of sunlight, because remember, its job is all day long. That corn plant's putting energy back into that ear. The thing we worry about here is 80 degrees. Remember that. 80 degrees nighttime temperatures. Something you and I can't control. But if we're over 80 degrees at night, this corn plant eats itself up. This guy's looking a little ragged. I cut him out of the field yesterday. I don't think he likes the air conditioning in the factory here. But so. All day long, he's taking energy in and he's filling these cells. And then at night, it comes out of the stalk and it comes into this guy. And this guy's all about saying, you know, I want to have as much corn as I can get. And so he's putting in all kinds of weight in him. If it's above 80 degrees, he gets nothing. The corn plant uses every bit of its energy it, concern, it gathered that day to stay alive. Back in 2011... I was out in Iowa, and an Iowa ag station said, we broke a record. We have 35 nights in a row above 80 degrees. And I will vouch for that. In 2011, I remember coming in and telling Cindy in the kitchen, "Hun, we are loaded for yield. And we ended up 40 bushel light. I was so discouraged. And it just pulled back on the tips. It just was not feeding it, and it just started, just like it would be if you ran out of nitrogen. So it's not something you and I can control. But if it's been 70 degrees, this morning I jumped in my truck, it was 71. I was like, oh, yeah, I like this. That's something we can play at. So we're going to raise a lot of corn. Well, then how do you and I capture it? And of all the products I've ever designed, this one intrigues me the most. It's called Yield Saver. It's something you put on your corn gathering chains. It's so simple. It's about gathering more into the grain tank instead of letting it fall through in the ground. And so we're out here, and this is on Twitter. A guy split a 12-row head, and he's asking, he said, can you believe this? And I'm like, yeah, I can believe it. We have a cover crop in Illinois that's corn most years. And it's not because they're bad operators. It's just the facts. That's just the way it happens. Show you a little demo here that we do. So you can see these little PVC snouts are running corn down on Yield Saver versus the OEM, and they're going to sweep it up here in the tarp and show you the response. And we've always said, we want to save 80%. Because if I can save you 80%, that's over two bushel an acre into the grain truck instead of on the ground. And I'm all in. And that's something I get really excited about. And so in this case, it ended up being 85.5. And that's real money. And so Yield Saver, I, guess I get a kick out of it. I get this question all the time, well, Greg, I harvest above 25%. I'm not sure I need brushes. Remember, it's more than just capture. It's also about cushion. So we're talking about when an ear comes down and it hits the deck plates, do we have seven kernels off the butt of it that go flying all over the place? And so it's about capturing as much as we can. Cushion and capture. And so our seed guy, this is a picture of us harvesting seed corn. This is my custom harvester. He runs deer heads instead of oxbow heads because he wants yield savers on. The yield savers gets all those small ears in, and we don't have near. We can see it to the row, the different combines 
on volunteer in the seed field the next year. And so it's about capturing as much of that grain as we can. And so again, Monsanto came out from St. Louis and they walked behind this. And this year he has three machines and they all run deer heads and he's all got yield savers on. We're harvesting 40% corn. We started two days ago. And they're harvesting above 40%. And they still see the benefit from coming down, even in that high corn, and capturing more kernel. So it's something that just tickles me. And it's something I get a kick out of as we watch. It's something as you get the combine in the shed here this week, and you're working on your corn head, it's something you need to think about. And you're sitting in the right spot wherever you are in the nation because you have a 360 dealer that invites you in for supper tonight that would love to talk to you about it. When it comes to planting, I think this is a no-brainer. If you made me pick, this is the same field. Two different corn heads did the harvesting of last year's corn. This is out in Iowa. I know which one I want to plant into next year. And so harvest it the same day, same variety. Look at the difference of residue left. Realizing what? For Mike and his team to take this and cash it out. Do you realize how many dollars are in a corn on cornfield? A hundred dollars a fertilizer. Now it takes Mike and his team five years to eat it all, to turn it to pocket change. And I told our engineering team, I'm an impatient sort. I said, guys, I don't have five years. I want to turn this thing much faster. And I said, I want residue to break down, not in five years. I want it to break down in two years. And they said, well, Greg, if we're going to break it down in two years, we're going to have to put some different stock rolls on. These are called 360 chain rolls. And they're all about just taking this residue and ripping it apart, chaining it together so that your planter pass next year can handle it. But it's opening up that residue and making it digest. So this is six-month-old corn stalks from last fall. John Deere intermeshing, John Deere post stock rolls compared to 360 chain rolls. What we're really doing is taking that residue, we cut it into seven inch pieces by design. I'm cutting it into seven inch pieces because I understand row cleaners. We design clean sweep. It's all about can row cleaners clean the path? If you and I leave residue in the seed trench, they're going to misfire. This little guy, we have a piece of residue laying right beside him that the row cleaner couldn't pick up out of there. And as that little ceiling root comes out and intersects with that residue, immediately ceiling blight can take him out. And so we realize that this is the goal. Every inch and a half, I fracture and pierce that stalk. This is taken in January in one of my fields. Look at Mike and his team. They're dead right now. They're frozen. This is cold. But look at the black. The black guys you see there is Mike. And they're digesting that stalk. And we took it to the lab, and they said twice the amount of potash. If I'm following soybeans into a cornfield and I use chain roll, you got twice the potash out of the residue than if you would have had to apply it. And so these are things I'm interested in. There's a confetti roll out there. They said, well, we can chop it up like Greg's corn silage, and we can just make lots and lots of small pieces and all of a sudden we run into this environment and you can see these little guys, they're much less in diameter and if you follow them in the field, you don't have any problem at all finding them and they're late emergers and they're pollinating late and they look pretty disgusting. And we went out and we did 150 foot trials, we did measurement after measurement and at the end we averaged 200 ears out of 150 feet with 360 and we only had 195 on the chopping roll after repeated tests, in other words, that looks about like six bushel and something very, very simple. As we do corn on corn, though, for years, we do tillage. So everybody down in Tennessee and Kentucky right now, their toes are curling when they think about you running tool, tillage. Everybody up in Minnesota thinks that's trash. They'd like to mow board. I got a friend in Minnesota that dairies. He pulls two 10-bottom plows. And he said, Greg, I have to. I got to get rid of it. I got to turn it under. He said, I can. He said we're harvesting. It's 30 degrees. He said, there is no bacteria activity. There is no breakdown of stocks up in Minnesota where he's at. And so for us, we do tillage. The problem I've seen for years is these mounds that you see here. And I used to tell Tim, I said, we got to fix this. He said, Dad, focus. We're planter people. And I said, but this is driving me nuts. Why am I spending all this energy if I leave it solid berms under there? 
So when we started 360, we jumped in. We said, what if we redesign a ripper point that's 14 inches wide, twice as wide as other things in the market, different angle and sweep that's now going to blow up and create an area where you can see it here on this side is a different pass of the same ripper with different shovels. And now we've fractured 12 inches deep. Instead of here, we got 40% of the berm intact. And so I watch this and I say, I'm all in. I'm all about saying, can we get a ripper point that fractures from point to point? Because I want roots. So you think about, well, so what, how do you run a ripper? Well, the main thing is you leave it level on top. So you got all this residue here. Usually the top five inches, you put a disc in. And then you're going to run it 12 inches deep. And I'm worried about these mounds in here. They're like this. There's 40% of really solid density. Next year, this little guy starts to get planted here. His root starts to come out, the crown root, hits that solid ground. What do you think he does? He can't get through. He turns, and he grows down around here. And you got all this N, P, and K sitting here, and you're not using it. Now, eventually, little hair roots will start to break into this, but I'm all about saying, can we just eliminate it? And would there be a yield response to it? So Beck's Practical Farm Research, they went out and studied it. K 7-inch Tiger Point compared to 360 Bullet, they showed after repeated checks, 7 bushel. Our trials, we've replicated it nine times in fields, harvested it. We showed five. So I'm excited if we say something as simple as a ripper point can make a difference. What about moisture? This is in Michigan. This individual had two rippers. He's got one ripper with a bullet on. He'd come in the same field that he had the case point on, and he kept track to where it was. And next spring, look at this spring. This is the spring of 2018. Which one do you think is going to plant better? The one with all the extra moisture over here or where he worked this? And you can see it to the row. And so this year was an unusual spring. We say that every year, don't we? There was an older farmer in our area. He'd tell his wife every year she was from town, and she married him. And every year he'd come home and say, boy, this is an unusual year. After about 30 years of marriage, she decided that every year is going to be unusual. And so as you look at this, I want to plant over here. And so on Twitter, on April 19th, I saw this picture, and it brought me pause. I do like road cleaners that make snowmen. you got to like this. I mean, those road cleaners did the job. It rolled up the snow. So he said on Twitter, I'm planting today in cold conditions, and there was a snowbank behind the barn. I just planted through it. And I'm like, I sure hope he checked his seed, because this better be a 99 saturated cold germ. This will be a cold drink of water, because we understood that April this year was not very friendly, was it? At the same time, I showed you that we had the warmest, driest May in years. Look at the dust following the planter. So if you went out and you're working your farms ahead of the planter, and you get too far ahead of the planter, all of a sudden you got this environment. This gentleman can get to where he'd work the ground for almost 10 days after it was worked. In other words, the one operation, he was farther ahead of the planter than he should have been, and so you can see the outcome. Look in the back here. You can see 10-foot stretches. Look at this little guy right here. He ran out. You, he's not a shallow planet. He flat ran out of moisture. And you look at this environment. Are we set up for success? Or are we set up for a challenge? And we go back in this field and we say, well, was the planting depth different? So we dig up the little guys and the mesocotyl is exactly an inch. And you can see it. We dig up the big tall guys and the mesocotyl from the crown to the seed is exactly an inch. The planter did its job. This guy here, flat, just didn't have any moisture. Then we go back in last week, and this is where the pain comes. And remember, every year in roundabout firms, it's worth about seven bushel to you. And you see this little guy that's half the diameter, and you see the fruit of that, and you start to say, you and I do have a part to play with nature. So, in closing, I want to encourage you. I don't know what farming system you're on. You could be the world's greatest strip tiller. You could be a no-tiller. You could be a vertical till. 
You and I have hold that key of responsibility saying, how do we position corn to win? Remember, I firmly believe we can spend less and earn more.